Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. This is episode number 504 for Wednesday, May the 17th, 2017. Nice to have you here. Now, it has been quite the week for cybersecurity researchers, and we've got two heavyweights in the industry that are going to be joining us tonight to speak about the WannaCry threat. We're going to learn what you need to know and nothing but it. So stick around. Sasha, what do you got for us tonight? Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Netflix is messing around with pricing in Australia. We're on the cusp of what could be a world-changing evolution in battery technology thanks to an Israeli startup. MP3 is dead, sort of. Let the VR headset Legal Wars begin. A company that won $500 million from Oculus is now going after Samsung's Gear VR. And the WannaCry ransomware is taking online threats to a whole new level. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5.TV is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Well, I am your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to the show. Sasha Dermatis is here with me and Henry Bailey Brown. It's so good to see all of you. I, I can't actually see you, but you can see me. I know you're here and it's nice to have you here. Um, okay. Just quick house cleaning off the top as we do. Um, I had a hard drive fail in my Unraid server. You right. heard about uh. it last week on episode 503 and went through that whole process. The good news, uh, both drives arrived. We were able to rebuild from Parity, and the Parity drive did not fail, so we didn't oh, lose okay. any data. <laughs> Yay! Then I upgraded Unraid to 6.3.3. Uh, the latest version of Unraid supports dual Parity drives, and so I stuck the 4 terabyte um, mm -hmm. secondary Parity drive in there, rebuilt that one, and it took as well. So now we have That's dual good. Parity, uh, and we've got uh, an expanded array and didn't lose any data. So great That's news, awesome. folks. And good job, thank you. Robbie. Ooh, unraid, way to go. Pat on the back. Um, and uh, thank you to those of you who have supported us uh, throughout the months. And, you know, these are the little expenses, not even little expenses, but the, the expenses that are unexpected here at the studio right. um, that have to be taken care of. But luckily, uh, you know, That's just right. for my sanity, we've got backups, but backups take time to recover from and the stress of, you know, what, what files and consolidating things together and all that kind of stuff. So, exactly. Uh, and so our, uh, we have our light bulbs in now. <gasps> Our light bulbs are in. Yeah, can you see that? We can oh. see again. <laughs> you can, oh. I see it in your glasses once in a while when we're oh. on your camera. If you look straight at your teleprompter, yeah, look up a little bit. See? Oh, look there's at that. the lights, That's folks. The lights. That's the lights. And uh, yeah, it certainly looks a little brighter in here tonight. <laughs> you need to do something about that, Robbie. <laughs> but you know what? Truly, it's it's our supporters. It's our it's every little thing that you do adds up and makes it possible to to yeah. you know when something fails replace it and there's so many cool it. ways that you can support category 5 tv network sasha where can they go well you can use our affiliate links which is great idea super fun mm -hmm. you could also be a patreon which will afford you great prizes Ooh, yes. prizes. Yeah. Um, you can just head on over to category5.tv and you'll see the support us link. And as Sasha says, there, there are what we call our partner links uh, or affiliate links or uh, shop with our partners, if you will. That's the, how it's named on the menu. But the cool thing about it is you buy from Amazon anyways, you buy from eBay anyways, and it's a way to support the show because a percentage of every single sale goes to support Category 5 TV. So we appreciate everyone who does that. I mean, oh. if you don't want to buy anything and you just want to give us money, there's ways to do That's that. That's fine. Too. We have a tip jar. Too. We'll take it. We'll <laughs> take it. Okay. I'm really, really excited. Finally. Finally. There is a trailer for Star Trek Discovery. Excellent. Ooh. Now we're we're live on a Wednesday night, and uh, CBS all, uh, CBS Access released the trailer 11 mm -hmm. minutes before we went live. Uh, it already is on our Facebook page. So if you go to cat5.tv/facebook, 
or just do a search for Category 5 Technology TV on Facebook. You're going to be able to watch the real trailer. I'm not talking about just a ship going... But that's cool. And a logo in space. and like so No, cool. no more of that. We've got a real trailer with actors and everything. So make sure you check that out. Really excited to finally have a new Star Trek show starting up oh, this fall. So awesome. Fantastic. Okay, we've got to get into it. Now, you've heard of WannaCry, WannaCryptor, WannaCrypt. This is the newest stream of ransomware that is attacking not just business networks, but the entire world. We're seeing a uh, huge infestation of this malware, and uh, it is, it's unprecedented. It's never, as far as I know, nothing quite of this scale mm -hmm. has ever happened before. Um, so it's being deemed potentially cyber warfare. It's being called all these kinds of things that, you mm -hmm. know, we're not really sure what is this right now. Is it just ransomware by some lucky hacker who decided to make some money mm -hmm. and is doing a fair job at that? Just a bit scary. I don't know, but we've got some industry professionals here with us tonight uh, in order to talk about that. Uh, Mark Skilton is our first interview tonight. He's a professor of practice in the Information Systems and Management Group at Warwick Business School in Coventry, England. And he researches cybersecurity. He's the author of Building Digital Ecosystems. And he's also got a new book that's just, uh, just about to come out. Uh, you can actually go to cat5.tv slash Mark, M-A-R-K, and when you go to that link, you're going to be able to see uh, the books and actually order a copy right off of Amazon as well, so check hmm. that out. Mark, it is so great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Robbie. I'm, uh, I mean, you, you, you have to be on the other side of the moon not to see some of the issues that are coming out of this uh, cyber attack, so thank you very much for having me. Yeah, cheers. And, um, you know, it is, uh, we, we can just get right into our conversation tonight because, as you say, you got to be living under a rock to not know what's going on. And uh, essentially, you know, this is worldwide news. We're speaking with you from Ontario, Canada, and you're in England. And this is a, a real global event. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a backstory on what you've seen as a uh, cybersecurity researcher uh, is, is really happening in, uh, in kind of the, the whole ecosystem of the Internet today? Yeah, that's a good question to ask me because that's the sort of thing I tend to look at. You know, you need to put this in perspective. You know, um, one way to look at it is, well, this is just Microsoft machines that are being affected. So if I'm on iOS from Apple or I'm using an open source system, then this doesn't really matter. It's not that of an issue. But then you hear about 11 million uh, users or PCs being affected and you get lots of different numbers. Um, the way I position this is I, I tend to call this as the third wave the third wave, if you will, of, of cyber attacks. I mean, the first wave I describe in the genesis of, of what I call enterprise scale uh, cyber attacks is really denial of service, DDoS as it's phrased. Right, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's basically stopping access to your system. Secondly, um, we've got data breaches, much like the famous Sony, Sony attack, which um, with that arguably not particularly terribly good film, but um, clearly was uh, an issue about stealing data and, and mm -hmm. the issue of, st st of uh, taking money off you. This is really the third way, just to get to the point, which is around ransomware, where it's actually holding you psychologically to ransom for money or to inflict um, emotional damage on you. But equally, you're seeing this now, having attacked hospitals in the UK, right. you know, in Canada, uh, in Russia, has been hit very, very heavily. Uh, it's over about 110 countries. And really, this is a, a smorgasbord, a, a panacea of the ecosystem that we're now living in, with the 24-7, uh, always connected, all these devices. But now, the legacy of, of all these sort of operating systems and whether there's a gap, you know, an air gap, and there's clearly been an exploit here that's been um, been opened up by, by, we believe, criminals, although uh, there has been some new news on that we can talk about as to who's caused this. But it, it just shows the scale of the way we're connected today, doesn't it? And the, mm -hmm. the nature of the threat now is about um, ransomware, unfortunately. And do we suspect that this is a targeted attack or is this, you know, it's so widespread, it seems like this is just like, how has this thing spread so quickly to so many systems? What are we looking at from that perspective? Well, academically, we, we talk about narrative engineering, which is a rather poncy sort of flashy word for what does that mean? But you see this with, uh, with uh, fake news and you hear this in terms of... Uh, information being put out there into the internet to create a, an impact. Now, I think right. what this is, to call it targeted is difficult to say that because effectively it is a exploit on a 
uh, weakness in the Windows XP system that we read, which is an old version of, of Microsoft's operating system. But that so anybody was, who hasn't... Like sorry, Windows XP was cancelled, so, you know, how is this still a problem today? Like, there is no... Well, nobody runs Windows XP anymore, right? Well, obviously not. Is that uh, the two things? You know, the poor National Health Service in the UK clearly got a got one here, and that they haven't. They've been repeatedly warned not, you know, to upgrade their systems. Because the patch Microsoft put a patch out in March this year to fix this, and they told yeah. them you've got to upgrade your systems. But equally, you can talk about um, how we put it um, unlicensed software, which may be in Russia and elsewhere. People using. Um, you right. know, potentially, um, I don't want to say these illegal versions, so these aren't protected by patches. So this is what's happening. It's a complex right. issue. I hear you. Okay. So what makes and now we're we're all kind of at this point in. Uh, like our viewers and uh, pretty much the world at large, we've all heard of ransomware. So we know that it is, it's an attack, it encrypts your files, it wants you to send Bitcoin uh, to, to basically pay the hackers in order to get your files back. What makes this new attack, this wave of the WannaCry uh, or WannaCrypt ransomware, what makes that so significantly different and why is this now a global event when there have been ransomwares in the past that have gone around? Well, obviously, you know, one of the things that's different this time is that um, another criminal uh, um, group stole some um, software which is called Blue Eternal. There's also some other software which has other unusual names. Now, this software was from the NSA, um, which is reported by the Israeli um, cybersecurity agency, I and think, this a couple is of fact? days ago. This is, in f yeah. this is a fact, yeah? Yeah, we believe so. So what we're finding is two, a combination of two things. You've got a, a worm, which is a thing that sort of weaves its way through into your XP vulnerability. But equally, there's been a backdoor method provided by a military-grade um, weapon, cyber weapon, which was stolen from uh, the NSA. And uh, what's happening is the combination is so lethal. This is why it's managed to get through fire, firewalls, managed to break through into all these PCs. Yeah. And so um, the question is, even if you had the patch, um, you probably would have been protected. But these computers, because of this additional piece of stolen military-grade cybersecurity weaponry, um, it's managed to do so much damage all over the world. It's, it's such a different world that we live in, isn't it, from you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and this yeah. is this was all speculated. You know, this is something that was futuresque, cyber warfare and things like that. Mm. And I wouldn't mind touching on that without getting too far into. You know, it's it's so easy to fall into conspiracy theories and and theoretical. Uh, you know, like we could just banter here and, and come up with all sorts of ideas of what might be going on. Um, but just backing up a little bit, we keep going back to this. This exploit is from Windows XP. Is it something that's also affecting other users? Well, indirectly, because obviously there's a denial of service here, and also um, you know you you lose patients' uh, medical rec well not lose the records, you lose medical care time. You can't um, go to banks, you can't go and buy stuff. Okay. It's the disruption that creates, you know, Robbie, so and uh, it's that's that part of the the impact of what they're trying to do. But it, basically, the, it's a financial gain. They've kind of so they've done a fire 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 store, a um, bit like the famous, um, you know, um, uh, Die Hard 4.0 movie. If you know the one, um, that's a, it's no joke. And that the, this kind of technology, when it can get through, break through the barriers of devices and Internet of Things now, with all these things connected, um, the damage it can do is really. Uh, what I particularly like, if I can just sort of raise a sure. point, is the. Um, uh, the Microsoft uh, legal counsel, the head of um, legal in Microsoft, wrote a blog a couple of days ago, which I thought was very interesting. He advocated that we should introduce a thing called the Digital Geneva Convention. The Digital mm -hmm. Geneva Convention. And I think that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I think what's happening is because if they're NSA and others, and not just the NSA, you know, you look at the UK government and others, they're all sort of stockpiling these side of weapons to protect themselves, but also to be able to do surveillance and do national security right. activities. Um, there's an issue about, you know, if you stockpile <coughs> nuclear weapons, you stockpile cybersecurity um, weapons, they need to have the same level of due diligence. You don't want to leave the door open and you don't want one going missing. You know, this is not a good thing. So mm -hmm. I think it's a good call by Microsoft. What I have an issue with, I don't know what your thoughts are, is that should it be just Microsoft saying they are the first responder? You know, they're a bit like the judge and the jury. Well, it's their system 
in the first place that got hacked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now they're saying we're going to fix you, but why was it hacked in the first place? You know. Yeah, you so know, I think like it's not like a. Issues here. It's not an automobile where you know we got to recall this car because it's our problem, right? Like this is this is much wider mm. scale than that. Um, yeah. And and you know this does bring us to the you know and it's it's such a dangerous thing for us to to get into this conversation because, like I said, we can so easily slip through to conspiracy theories and things like that. But uh, but it really does. We do get the sense that we're looking at a cyber warfare kind of uh, issue here. Uh, so the underlying technology being that it comes from these um, government bodies and now has that been stolen through data theft and, and used by cyber criminals or what are we what are we looking at? Well we're looking at that isn't it? You look at the whole Edward Snowden affair and sure. uh, WikiLeaks and the, the self-appointed and it depends which particular side of the political divide the, the persuasion you have of course but um, mm -hmm. You know, you have these um, the potential of digital, much like you and I are talking on this um, connection right now. It's a very powerful medium. You know, you're in different parts of the world, but we can connect in instant time. And um, I think the people, the reality that we have to understand, and this is not new, is that the ability to work at the speed of light with these technologies, which is not the physical, it doesn't have the physical constraints that the physical world has, is that you've got situations where people can steal information about you, uh, your identity, they can basically do an enormous amount of harm within hours or minutes or seconds even. And this sure. is really the issue, you know, with artificial intelligence and being able to automate this. As I said, this is the third wave, uh, Robbie, in terms of the ransomware is a intelligent cyber weapon. It's not a dumb brutal sort of brick through the window kind right. of thing this is intelligent it picks you out and it, you know where this may go is a good debate it presents itself as something like this this could be some really smart kids making money off of their hack mm. it presents itself that way it reads itself that way it pops up on your screen and says your files are encrypted in order to get those back send money to so why would, uh, like, just, this is, you know, to put a theory out there, why would a government use some tactic like that in order to, um, in order, in order to in infiltrate computer systems? And, and essentially, like, looking at the hospitals and looking at um, government and uh, possibly charitable organizations who, do who never had the budget to upgrade uh, from Windows XP, for example. So why would these be targets of this widespread attack well it's always the vulnerable that get attacked i think the two points quickly on this is it's unfortunate the people with the least money or cash constraints or um you know ironically the people who may be using illegal versions of this software that get, yeah. get caught out with this but equally in terms of going back to the narrative in that some of these things is about creating obfuscate no creating a, a fog a kind of noise in the market that might be to do to undermine an election or it might be to undermine certain credibilities mm -hmm. or in in most cases with criminal intent is to steal money or to get intellectual property you know i'm not pointing fingers towards the asia for example or equally it goes both ways to be, be even-handed about this it is now um really we talk about the police we talk about, uh, sorry, the, the, this is the fourth theatre of war. We talk about land, sea, and air as the three uh, you know, battlefields, if you will, of war. Mm -hmm. It is now the fourth area of war right. is now the, the digital digital world. And uh, I think we have to realise this reality. There's the thing about Microsoft legal counsel saying we need a, a digital Geneva Convention because mm -hmm. this thing is rapidly getting out of scale, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, and and it is it's a, it's a changing world right now, in, in that you know we we are no longer dealing with you know your antivirus because we've got mm. viruses that might get into your your boot sector, like that's no longer the mm. the big concern. You know, I sell antivirus, mm. and I, I yeah. no, you need the firewall. You absolutely need the firewall. Don't mm. opt out of that. Don't turn it off. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was talking to um, uh, another cybersecurity expert friend who's a um, very, very, very deep technical expert in this area. And he says one of the critical things to have the wake-up call with the WannaCry issue, which I thought was very interesting, and I put it on my Huffington Post blog, mm -hmm. um, was this issue around um, this type of cyber attack is very sophisticated, that you and I are not technically able to actually fix it. So we just it's a bit like locking the front door with your antivirus, as you say, uh, Robbie. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not sufficient because they got, this is a worm. And then it was using military-grade um, sort of backdoor methods in addition to that. So, right. like, hang on a minute, you know, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's not, it may be laughing at it. But My toy lightsaber didn't work. 
yeah. it didn't work. And uh, but I think the issue is that there, it's a multi-level response that's needed. Point one and point two is we now need governments, uh, not just Microsoft, but we need experts to deal with this kind of threat because it's now, as I said, gone to the third level, which is you know, machine learning. It's artificially yeah. intelligent. And just the normal patches and fixes isn't going to be enough going forward. And that's, I think that's the big wake-up call. Oh, you're, you're, you're scaring me to death here, buddy. <laughs> like <laughs> well, just the thoughts you know, of the evolution. I wish I could of, tell you better. Yeah, yeah. Now, are there are there folks? In the, you know, we know about Microsoft's um, proposals and what what's going on there. But what is uh, <laughs> what's in place right now to uh, to protect the world at large? Well, there are two things. Probably one is that governments have got their big agencies. So in the UK, for example, you've got the National Cyber Security Agency, which is specialising on monitoring this this threat, and it's a, an adjunct to the uh, GCHQ, the, you know, the the, the national. Um, surveillance agency in the UK. The similar operations are in the U United States, of course, and Canada sure. and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So we have at the government level now taking far more serious um, attention and investment in that area. But I think the gap that is missing at the moment is really, you know, to put it bluntly, we get our pants, we found our pants or knickers were basically between our drawers here. With Microsoft, they, they, they're not updating their software probably, and they put commercials around it. So Windows XP is now a old, old version, so yeah. we don't support it. But that's not really acceptable as a consumer. I've lost my data. I've been attacked. So I think we need to have uh, vendors particularly having more accountability and responsibility both sides of the pond in wherever they come from. Is yeah. that when you're selling a product, this stuff, you've got to look after it. And it's so we need them thing, to do more. Like where, it where does hard. it end? Where does it end for a software developer? Because you look at a car and you buy a car and how long is your warranty for that car? Like at a certain point, it becomes your responsibility. And when we and cybersecurity researchers like yourself have been saying to folks for years now, upgrade, get off of Windows XP, do not continue running that system. You've got that computer that you barely ever use that still has XP on it, never turn it on. Scrap it. Get rid of it. It's not, well, it's not really fair to put it on Microsoft, I don't think, as much as you know, we're, we're Linux people here, but it's, it's such a tough thing. There has to be something think, bigger than that. Yeah. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's a really good point you're making here because I think the nature of what you're describing with a car, the analogy of a car, is sure. it's a physical thing. You can touch it. You can say, oh, right, I'm going to put in a new engine or I'm going to basically scrap it. Yeah, and it's the a thing that depreciates. The Software can keep yeah, running that's, forever, indefinitely. Uh, exactly, and that's the problem. So I just read that apparently yesterday um, the dear old MPEG-3 format is apparently now defunct yeah. is out and it's no longer supported but that doesn't mean to say it's gone away sure it's still potentially could and it's not analogous in this area but the point i'm making is that the digital world exploits both modern systems as well as old systems and i think again there needs to be some accountability i've been saying in the media the last few days that maybe we need a a cyber security police force a bit like um you know the yeah. first responders <laughs> now who do you call you know not ghostbusters no joke <laughs> you need you, you need to basically take this up with somebody um and I, I don't think there's a clear way forward yet and i think this is a big wake-up call for everybody yeah and we'll see a lot of changes i think over the the course of the next little while as well um, Mark, we really appreciate your time and, uh, and for sharing with us. Uh, do we have any, any inkling as to what's next with WannaCry? Has it kind of tapered off through the efforts of, of security uh, researchers and companies? No, um, I, I wish I could tell you better. No, this has just accelerated, obviously, the patches for this particular attack, but this is going to be more the norm going forward where we have more um, insidious and psychological um, attacks on our identity and liberty and, and rights. And uh, I think, really, this is just a matter of escalation. I think the concern, particularly, is around weapons, of cyber weapons by governments now need to be under much more um, you know, secure environments because if this yeah. stuff gets out... Um, you know, I can give you a quick analogy with, say, um, in advanced um, biological weapons, just to pick a very uh, serious example. You don't expect those Category 4 or Category 5 uh, labs to basically be open door institutes. And so I think the problem with digital, of course, is that they're much more vulnerable. So we need to be very careful about this going forward. 
Sure. And I think it's quite possible that, you know, companies and hospitals and industries need to take this more seriously, to take protection more seriously. It's amazing how, like, DLP solutions and endpoint firewalls that, that prevent data theft and things like that, they've existed for so many years, and they've evolved to the point where they're very, very good. And yet, so few have them in place. Yeah, I mean, people just don't follow procedures, point one. I mean, it's just the old adage, you know, how many times do you need to get hacked and basically change your behaviour? You know, this is a this is a wake-up call. But uh, I think what's more concerning is if we're getting military-grade, military-grade cybersecurity weapons out in the open market rather than, you know, the dark web, this is not a great development. And I think that's sure. going to be something that for the authorities on both sides of the, you know, all over the place are going to be exploiting. So, you know, this is not going to be the last story, I suspect, unfortunately. For sure, for sure, and I, I, I do believe that this is, uh, you know, kind of the start of change for a lot of a lot of the industry because people, as you say, yeah. it's a wake up call. People are realizing, yeah. okay, well, we've kept these machines running and we've thought that it was okay, and we've ignored the mm. warnings of our IT people, and uh, you know, now it's time to really step things yeah. up. So we'll sort of yep. see the evolution over the next little while. Absolutely. I mean, if you've got connected cards, you know, you've got banking, yeah. um, online banking. You've got medical devices, maybe even wearables on your body and stuff. Not only your identity and your your very life could, could depend on these systems working properly in the in the mm-hmm. new economy. So this is, I think, a, a level of security and uh, surveillance, but also prevention. I think the prevention has been proven in this case. Is it's not ready yet, and uh, this is going through cycles. They've now got this warning, first warning that this is where ransomware can go. And you just, it's amazing. We've got over 110 countries got attacked in this. Yeah, uh, that's not just one or two. I mean, it's like everybody's going down on this one. And I think what I've said earlier was we do need a much more investment, even you know, in America or Japan or in, in the modern economies, need to be sharing information, need to be responding as a almost like the fourth emergency service across the globe as well as within their own countries because mm-hmm. this is this is a, a, a state of war. I'm not being exaggerating this to, to be alarmist for, for yeah. the viewers that we need to be treating this incredibly seriously, way more than we're you know, the level of, that we're doing at the moment. We've got to be very sure and strong in our response because we're sure as hell the criminals are going to be doing the same. Yeah, and it's a, a big wake-up call for a lot of folks, including myself, where, you know, it's it's kind of becoming that way where, okay, we need to be ready for what's to come, and uh, and that's mm-hmm. the fact. That's un- unfortunately yeah. the fact of this world that we're living in right now. So uh, we've, yeah. we've been speaking with Mark Skelton. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Um, Mark has a website. If you want to check him out, learn more about his research, check out his books as well. It's markskelton.com. I've got that uh, linked below. Uh, and Mark, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you very much indeed for having me. All the, All best. the best. Take care. And just another mention that we do have Mark's books on our site if you go to cat5.tv slash Mark. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for joining us tonight as we dig into this wanna cry. Wanna cry. I I wanted to be grammatically correct. I wanted to say want to cry. Want Uh, to cry. We're looking into the wanna cry threat. Now, we have a huge viewer, like a global viewership, and I know that North America wasn't strongly hit, but again, our viewers are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, many of our viewers, slight Linux bias, use <laughs> use Linux, but that doesn't sure. mean that you that you can all of the time. Which means that at work and and such, oh, yeah. you work might be is effective, a yeah. right? Yeah. So if you or somebody you know or love has been affected by WannaCry, we want to hear your story. So comment below because I want to know. I mean, how far this yeah. has gone? I personally don't know anybody that mm-hmm. has been, but. I also live in North America, where the right. where it was lightest. Knock on wood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, until and we're going to see it. I think uh, <laughs> over the next little while, we're going to see those infections. Kind of, you'll start mm-hmm. to see them in the local news as well, right? Right. And that's the scary thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have to take a really quick break, but when we come back, we've got another interview. We're going to be speaking with uh, ESET senior researcher, uh, senior security researcher. Pardon me. Uh, he is uh, Stephen Cobb. Uh, you've heard of him before. Join us as he shares his views on the wanna cry threat. Stick around. Jeff Weston. Yaman. Yeah, you're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? You need hosting. 
One of the things about a hosting account is you don't want to have limitations put on your website. It's true. How much hard drive space do you have? How many email accounts? How many domains can point to it? Well, we've got an amazing deal for you. For a very limited time, cat5.tv slash dreamhost. For just $5 and a bit of change per month, you are going to get unlimited website hosting, unlimited email accounts on that hosting uh, service. You are also going to receive a free domain name. Ooh. So your own .com. Nice. To put that amazing website that you've been working on it's on true. there. If you run, if you want to build a WordPress site, fine. Sign up. Cat5.tv slash dreamhost. Just don't put Panama Papers on it. Just don't do it. But hey, uh, it's a great deal, folks. Best deal you're going to find. $5 and change per month. Go to cat5.tv slash dreamhost. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and our website is Category5.tv. Now, we're talking all about WannaCry, this ransomware attack that hit over the weekend. And uh, we are joined uh, tonight by Stephen Cobb. He's a senior security researcher at, uh, at ESET. Stephen, it is great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Now, Stephen, we've all heard of ransomware. We've heard of things like, you know, it started with things like CryptoLocker, and, and it's evolved since then. But uh, we're really hearing about WannaCry from all different news outlets all around the world. And, you know, the question comes out, you know, is this all hype? What is different about WannaCry? There have been ransomware attacks in the past. So what is, you know, your perspective on what WannaCry is and why it's so significantly different? All right, so it wanna cry or which we detect as something we called it wanna crypto and different companies have called it slightly different names, but this this thing which started to hit on Friday really is is a blend of a fairly standard ransomware that encrypts files and asks for money paid in Bitcoin to decrypt the files. Mm -hmm. But with a spreading technique which borrowed from an actual NSA tool or exploit that is very, very effective. So once this thing hits a network, it can spread very, very quickly within the network. And so this is not how typically a criminal would want to spread a piece of ransomware, because as you can see from the news coverage over mm -hmm. the last four days, uh, the person who released this or persons who released this instantly jumped to the top of the cyber most wanted list. So, and it's because of this infectious capability, which we, we would refer to as a worm capability. And, it, and if, you know, if listeners are, and viewers are, are in this space, worm is something which goes back to the very beginning of the internet, right. where something called the Morris Internet Worm proved kind of accidentally <laughs> that, that worm code, which is self-replicating code, can spread incredibly quickly, can block the whole internet it, back then it did. And, and there have been outbreaks since then um, over time where somebody's released something onto uh, the internet, which has used that highly connected state of internet machines to spread very quickly. And then within companies, which many of which have huge networks of connected machines, very spread very, very quickly within those networks. And, and that led to this rapid pace of distribution. And we're looking at, you know, we hear about ransomware attacks where um, there are one or two companies that are uh, infected and they lose their files, they're encrypted. Um, and we hear that in the news. But this is, you know, what is the difference in scale here? What are we looking at? So I haven't checked the latest figures, but it, it rapidly went to 100,000 and 200,000. Uh, systems. Companies? I think it's. Is this companies, individual companies? Um, well, see, it, 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 that gets tricky to, mm -hmm. to, to pass the statistics. Um, I, I, I think we would say that's 200,000 systems. I mean, it's close gotcha. to 300,000 now. Wow. Um, and then um, we saw it spreading country to country. And obviously, the, the first big reports were those coming out of the National Health Service in the UK where I think actually probably out of an abundance of caution, a lot of systems were shut down proactively, which was a smart thing to yeah. do. Um, you know, back in 2000, when the I love you worm uh, broke out from the Philippines, uh, it was the decision of a lot of companies and, and 
frankly, federal agencies and government agencies just to pull the plug on the internet. Sure, yeah. Uh, was, uh, an example, I was speaking with uh, with somebody who runs the towers at all the airports in Canada, and they just literally ripped out the internet. They they have no internet now. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was infectious in a way which really wasn't well controlled. Sure. And and so, you know, you, you, you this leads us to kind of speculate about speculate about who did this. You know, yeah. is it somebody who realized what would happen? Um, because you you this the use of ransomware by criminals is endemic, but it tends not to get reported. I mean we we hear of lots and lots of cases of companies and individuals, you know, getting their photographs uh, uh, encrypted and sure, yeah. money asked. Um, you know there's, there's a whole area of the internet where you can learn about what Bitcoin is to go and pay your ransomware, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of these ransomware programs have their own customer service uh, to help people wow. get the Bitcoin. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and think about it. You know, I, my, my wife showed me something last night, a Venn diagram of people using unpatched systems and people who know how to get Bitcoin. And they really don't overlap that much, right? I mean, for about a year now, I've been asking audiences when I speak, how many people know how to pay something with Bitcoin? Right. And very few people do. So, so yeah, a, a good, <laughs> good piece of ransomware has instructions on how to make the payment. And uh, they do provide customer service. And I did notice to, that with Wanna Cryptor, that it, its interface has a button that says, how do I buy Bitcoin or something like that. Like it's, yeah, it because you, you have to explain it to people. Um, and so you're, you're looking at very profitable uh, malware scheme here, but one which you would conduct in a, in a fairly orderly manner, typically. Um, and, and we've seen ransomware so far. Before WannaCry, we saw kind of two levels. Mm -hmm. One is the, the, the use of email to random people right. to infect them with infected email. The other is more targeted where we have seen uh, criminals go after an institution they know has valuable files. Okay. And, and the classic being a hospital. Sure. And then you can, mark, then you can make, instead of ask for 300 Bitcoin, uh, for $300 in Bitcoin, uh, you can ask for a lot more money. And, and we've seen plenty of cases of that against hospitals around uh, the United States. And, and, and we were speaking with uh, with Mark Skilton a little bit earlier, and one of the points that was made is that these are industries and these are networks that perhaps don't have the budget in order to upgrade, and that's the very reason that we have this exploit in existence. Um, now, I want to back up just a little bit because here on the show, uh, Stephen, we, we do try to avoid conspiracy theories when we can. And we, we hear about the NSA exploit that is involved in the capabilities of this ransomware to, to spread. Um, can, you, can you back that up for us with just a little bit of, you know, what, this is not a ransomware that was created by the NSA. This is, no, this no. is something that is exploiting a uh, uh, factor in Windows that was created by the NSA. Is that a correct way to yes. look at it? Yes. So, so in its role as a spy agency and a protector of American interests, um, the NSA, like agencies in other countries, like GCHQ in, in the UK, uh, you know, explores uh, malicious code capabilities, uh, or they probably wouldn't even call it malicious code, but penetration code or, or network monitoring code. And they found a hole in, in part of Windows uh, called SMB. And they developed... That's file actually, sharing, just strict file sharing. Yeah, and, and, and they, they, they found a way to exploit that. Uh, and they wrote the code for it. And there were actually two parts of the code. Um, the part that, that gets a starring role in, in this is called eternal blue, you know, one of those computer-generated code names they use at the NSA. Yeah. So the NSA has been has been creating these codes, which uh, this code which exploits um, unpublished vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. shall we call them, or sometimes they're called zero-day exploits. Um, they've been doing this for some time, and they have a collection of this stuff, and it was compromised. So a group called Shadow Brokers uh, has been making this secret NSA code available. And so the, the code that is eternal blue, the, which is the bit which 
is leveraged by WannaCry yeah. uh, is out there. I mean, you can literally go to, to GitHub and download oh, it. Oh, okay. So this and, is the code that the NSA developed? Is that... Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so you've got the NSA developing secret code that exploits unknown vul- un- publicly unknown vulnerabilities that are unpatched in, in commercial products. It keeps those secret to use for its own purposes. But somebody stole them or leaked them. And so those have then been published. Um, this group, the Shadow Brokers, they wanted money for it. They didn't get money for it. So they published some of this code. Okay. People then figured out how to you know, put that into practice in the real world. And in fact, we, uh, we saw this last month already uh, being, you know, being used in various ways out on the Internet. And in fact, we were we were protecting in, in the ESET product against this vulnerability before WannaCry came on the scene. Mm. That's because an interesting could, fact, hey? Like, you, you've known about this, and you've protected against it before it happened. So, you know, it's, it's Windows XP that can't be updated. It's hacked versions of Windows 10 that, uh, that can't be updated that still have this exploit in existence. Is yeah, that- so, so, so one of the things that happens with an outbreak of code like this mm-hmm. is that you, you kind of find out the weak points in the global infrastructure, right? So uh, as, you, as you correctly say, uh, XP, which actually is supported by Microsoft. So to be clear, you know, Windows found out about this problem, this vulnerability in March and patched it. And they actually patched it for XP oh, okay. uh, and some other unsupported systems if people were paying for support. So say you're a large um, manufacturing facility and you've got a lot of robots that run Windows XP, right? You may pay for Microsoft support. Microsoft will support you. But what the world discovered on Friday is there's a large number of people using bootleg XP, bootleg Windows 7, right. uh, bootleg Windows 10. and particularly in developing countries, you know, where they, they either can't afford to get a licensed version of something or uh, they can't afford the support or, the, you know, they need something which runs on cheap hardware. So a lot of systems out there were not patched. Um, and, and those were susceptible to this problem. Can I ask, like, if, when, you, when you look at a heat map of the attack, Russia is is red with this attack. Is it because of... Like, is it an attack on Russia, or is it just that they are using a lot of um, you, vulnerable you, applications? You really get into a lot of trouble drawing too many conclusions from a heat map, right? Sure. Um, this know, is what's deceiving about that heat map, because it really looks le- like that's the case, but is it just illegal well, copies well, it, of Windows? But you don't know why those systems are infected, right? right. So you can say, oh, look, somebody targeted Russia because it's all infected. Or you might say, no. <laughs> Nobody in Russia had patched anything. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you don't know which of those it is. Sure. Um, we had our own heat map, which was which was fairly useless because it was showing how many of our customers were infected and, and very, very few were, if any, right? Yeah. So it, and, and it depends. You know, there, there are, um, there, there, there's a lot going on in something like, like that reporting. And, uh, just like you know, the, the question of who created this is is just very difficult to determine uh, without a lot of information, right? Uh, and and typically more than you can see in the code. And do you suspect that this is uh, a very successful hacker that is doing this to make a lot of money, or do we suspect that this is potentially cyber warfare that is trying to create a smokescreen for something else? Uh, as we were speaking about earlier in the show, uh, what, what's the suspicion in, uh, on that front? So, I think at this point, it, it is very difficult to distinguish, even probabilistically, between multiple different scenarios. Uh, one scenario is that somebody who didn't understand the implications of what they were doing thought this mm-hmm. would be a cool thing to do, oh. to add a worm capability to a piece of ransomware and push it out there. Um, you know, and they'd make money quicker than anybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, that hasn't worked, by the way, because there are other <laughs> ransomware programs that have made a lot more money uh, than this one. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, another scenario, as you kind of hinted, might be a, a havoc factor. You know, let's 
let's kind of wreak havoc here. Sure. Uh, because if you knew what the implication of the code was, you would know this thing would spread very, very quickly. Right. Um, or, you know, another, another scenario would be that somebody wanted to uh, point out how insecure our, our internet infrastructure is around the world. And, and there's a precedent for that. You know, the very first macro virus uh, that spread widely was a proof of concept. And so wow. the, the, the motives of virus writers and, and people who release malicious code are, are very difficult to ascertain until you get to speak to them in person. Mm. We're speaking with Stephen Cobb. He's a senior security researcher with ESET. Uh, questions in the chat room at this point in the interview? Yes, we do. We have a few wonderful questions here. I actually have two right now that have been really going around. Um, firstly, we just want to have confirmation of how exactly this stuff spreads, right? So like, is it through emails? Is it, is it through downloads, things like that? And the second part of that question, are other systems also in danger, like Mac, um, other systems such as Linux, things like that, older versions maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but what about the new stuff? So that a lot of people are asking those questions as well. So to take the, the, the second part of that first, this particular WannaCry, this particular thing which we dubbed WannaCryptor and, and uh, and broke out on Friday is a Windows threat, right? So it, it's written to exploit Windows. Um, technically, though, um, it would be a mistake to say you couldn't have a, a similar outbreak on other operating systems. Um, and, and we certainly have seen ransomware for all of the different, from Linux, uh, Mac, Mac operating system, Android, iOS, people are trying to exploit those vulnerabilities and weaknesses in those systems in order to extract ransom, even if it's as simple as, as locking up your phone until you pay to unlock it. Uh, in, in terms of exactly how this one spread, I think my, my understanding at this point, uh, and we're still doing uh, analysis on this, is that it was probably seeded through email attachments. And that's the classic where, you know, there is a, uh, an attachment to email, which is very intriguing. You, you, you are tempted to click on it. That brings down the, the, the malware, the first part of the malware onto your system. And then it, the malware calls back to the command and control center, the C2, and gets instructions. And, and then, in this case, sees if it can spread to other computers connected to your computer. And so... That is where a lot of the speed and, and impact of the spread came from. Um, and, and in fact, that, that was also the way that was implemented and ended up being a weakness in this particular version of the code because um, that C2 connection uh, was open to interference. And that's what happened when um, you know, somebody, a gentleman from the UK, uh, registered the domain that was being used for the command and control center. And that essentially sinkholed what we call sinkhole the thing and triggered a kill switch within the code. Mm. And, and that, those things, the, the kill switch uh, and the C2 are standard parts of, of many different kinds of malware. Uh, but it was generally considered to be a mistake that, that, that you could actually just trigger a kill switch through, the, um, through registering that domain. So right. uh, again, that, 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 you know, these are things we take as clues as to you know who was behind it, it was somebody. Certainly, somebody made a mistake. Wow! Right now, Stephen, what can users do to protect themselves, like individually and also as businesses? Is there? So I think I think the one word that you know, if you had to boil it down to, it would be patch. Right? It would be make sure you are installing your operating system patches. I mean, a lot of systems now, Windows 10 is doing automatic patching for a lot of people. Um, and so you want to make sure if, if you can, as an individual user or as a company, can you, if you can, if it's feasible, do automatic patching. Uh, do not delay if, if Microsoft comes out with, or Apple comes out with a critical update or an update that says, fixes security vulnerabilities, you want to install that, right? Um, on the other hand, you have, to, you have to note that it's not 
as easy as it sounds, and this is this is something which is being lost, I think, in some of the news reports, is if you install a big patch on um, you know a 200 unit network, mm -hmm. a 200 seat network, and, and that crashes the network, right? Oh, you, yeah. You've got problems. Yeah. Typically, what happens in a in a company situation is that the IT department receives the patches, tests them to make sure they don't break anything that you're using, and then rolls them out. And so that can delay things. Um, there are some systems which it's infeasible to um, to update. And, and an example would be uh, embedded operating system, where the operating system is part of a set of code, and this happens in medical equipment, that's been certified at a certain set uh, configuration. And so it's not necessarily possible to just immediately update that right. and so on. The corollary to that is you should be reusing, so the second thing after patch is security software. You know, there, there, there's good security software out there uh, that was already looking for the exploit that was included in WannaCrypt. And a good security suite uh, will protect against something like this, particularly if you've got cloud updating enabled. So, you know, for in our product, but other products as well, you have a cloud connection to your security software so that as soon as a new thing is detected, that is pushed out to all of the systems. And so we had several levels of protection kicking in in our product over time, some well before WannaCrypt came out, then uh, on the day that it came out and, and continue updated because guess what? Other people have thought, hey, I might try this. Uh, and so we're, we're seeing the same exploit now uh, being incorporated into different types of malware. Uh, Bitcoin mining malware is one example uh, where mm. the, the bad, yeah, the bad guys oh. try and get on your machine oh. and use your machine to mine Bitcoin. Make a botnet to, to mine Bitcoin. I got gotcha. you. Yep. That's crazy. So ESET has been protecting its users already from before this infection came. So are there specific products uh, for business or home users that are going to do uh, a particularly good job of uh, protecting against these kinds of cyber attacks? Because we think about antivirus, for example. This is not, right. this isn't going to classify itself as the traditional virus that's going right. to stop so, that. So, you know, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting point because traditionally our main products, our security software, uh, has been an antivirus product. Sure. And, you know, when, when, when viruses, I mean, Viruses come and go, but there's a lot of other kinds of malicious code, so we call it anti-malware. And wouldn't you know it, it's hard to make people say anti-malware. They still call it antivirus. Yeah, yeah. And then we started adding things like network protection within the product and anti-phishing within the product and uh, malicious website blocking within the product. And mm. yet we're still kind of talked about as a you know an antivirus company, mm. but it's, it's a, a good endpoint security product is what you're looking for. And, you know, we have a, a range of endpoint security products for every platform uh, and, and for the business and for the consumer. And that's what you want. And, and, and these days, an endpoint security product is going to do those things. Yes, it's going to know if a new virus or, or worm comes out and block that. Right. But it's also going to be checking things at the network level uh, like we do. And it's going to be looking at how the user is using the machine so that if, if they're in email and they click on an attachment which is going to a you know an infectious website that gets blocked gotcha mm -hmm. now what what is next for WannaCry? are we are we going to start seeing this taper off with all the attention that has been getting from cybersecurity professionals or is this something that's going to continue to evolve and turn into something that's. Well, I, I know. Than I know. It, I don't want to take this lightly, but if I had mm. to guess, I would say that sometime on Friday, it's going to wake up again because, mm. darn it, these things seem to hit on Friday. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it just oh, just dear. ruins your weekend. Your poor um, staff. Yeah, you know, with the staff. big Mirai botnet attack on the on the DNS services mm -hmm. happened on a Friday, um, and, and there's there's actually some logic to that. If you're going to launch a piece of malware. Uh, I shouldn't even say this, but, you know, the bad guys already know it. Friday, not a bad time. You know, mm -hmm. people are leaving early for the weekend. From a criminal perspective, it makes sense to attack on Friday 
Uh, yeah. Please don't. <laughs> um, but, but I, I honestly don't know what's going to happen next. You know, it, it depends which of these scenarios um, Wanna Cry conforms to. You know, who who is doing it, and what's their what's the point? Is there any um, clue? Is there any clue? Like, is this thing calling home at all? Or so you know, there's there's North Korea has been floated um, because of similarities of you know the big chunks of code okay. in Wanna Cry, which which are also in code related to the Lazarus group, which is associated with North Korea. Okay. And, uh, but, but that's not conclusive at all. We don't know. Um, we just don't know. Well, I would say this, that my, my, myself and my colleagues at ESET are very conservative around attribution. Sure. Because it's, it's in the nature of code that it can be exactly replicated. Yep. I mean, it's just it, it's just like an MP3 recording. You can you can just clone it ad infinitum, right? I mean, you you can patch things together. And so, what we if we see a similarity, our first suspicion is a red flag, right? Um, oh, sorry, sorry, red flag, false flag. Um, oh, for the you mean for the definition? Already in slip there. Hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, not not all false flags are red flags. Sorry. Okay, um, so you mean in your definitions when you see that and. Yeah, so so, okay. so we we have we have actually Ooh. seen code which were where somebody's trying to make it look Russian. Right. Oh, okay. Right. right. So so it's it's a it's a known thing in malware writing is to throw artifacts in there to throw people off if they're trying to find out who wrote it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Stephen, uh, I appreciate your time very, very much. I mean, we're going to see this thing evolve, I think, over the next little while. Hopefully it does not hit you on Friday. But uh, <laughs> keep up the great work there at ESET and, uh, and you know, with all the protection that you're providing, uh, the proactive nature of the ESET products. Make sure you check them out. Uh, it's ESET.com. Uh, Stephen Cobb joined us tonight, and thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you. Great to be here. Have yourself a great night. You too. All right, this is Category 5 Technology TV, and we've got to head over to the newsroom. So, Sasha Dermatis, what do you have for us today? Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Netflix is messing around with pricing in Australia. We're on the cusp of what could be a world-changing evolution in battery technology thanks to an Israeli startup. MP3 is dead, sort of. Let the VR headset legal wars begin a company that won 500 million dollars from oculus is now going after samsung's gear vr and the wanna cry ransomware is taking online threats to a whole new level these stories are coming right up don't go anywhere now here's another great way you can support the shows you love from the Category 5.TV network by shopping at GearBest. That's right, Jeff. Uh, Cat5.TV slash GearBest. It's an online store for the geek streak in you. Or the loved ones. Well, of course. I mean, especially your loved ones, right? Uh, because Cat5.TV slash GearBest, quite frankly, has all of the greatest tech gifts that you could ever hope for at rock bottom prices. Do they have cell phones? You betcha. Cat5.tv slash GearBest has a wide assortment of unlocked Android cell phones and tablets. What about compu uh, consumer electronics? Those make a great gift. Absolutely. From high-tech watches to action cameras, headphones, even virtual reality headsets. Cat5.tv slash GearBest has you covered. They literally have it all, Jeff. Literally. Really? It's like a superstore right from the comfort of your own chair at your computer through the interweb. Yeah, I, there's no way they have it all. It's true. It's just a bunch of ele uh, random electronics. Test me. Um, what about clothes? Yep. Both men and women, fashionable apparel at rock bottom, super duper prices. Kind of like this. Well, look at this coat. What do you think? It's a slimming mock leather jacket. I love it. It's available for less than $30 plus free shipping at cat5.tv slash gear best. All right. You kind of got me there. Wow. Any other questions for me, Jeff? Uh, now that the winter has passed, flying season. Do they have any good deals on, say, drone copters? Oh, my goodness. Well, check this out. Dude, they have everything. Check out over 500 various drones. 
And not only that, they're available marked down by about 30 to up to 63% off the regular price. Love it. What's the website again? Well, you're going to find GearBest on our partners' pages for any of your favorite Category 5 TV shows like New Every Day, Category 5 Technology TV, The Pixel Shadow. Uh, but of course, if you want to shop absolutely right now and you want to go straight to the site, all you have to do is visit cat5.tv slash gearbest. See, that's easy. cat5.tv slash gearbest. That's right. Happy shopping. I'm Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories for the week of May 17th, 2017. Would you pay more to get your Netflix fix? How about on weekends when the urge to binge strikes hardest? A price hike could well be in the works with the streaming giant quietly testing out changes to the cost of plans in Australia. Netflix has tested upping Australian prices by as much as $3 Australian over the weekends, increasing its basic plan from $8.99 to $9.99 a month, its standard plan from $11.99 to $13.99, and its premium plan from $14.99 to $17.99 a month. Netflix confirmed that it had tested price changes, but was quick to emphasize that it had not made any announcement to change prices, either locally or globally. Regardless, Australians could be up for a Netflix price increase within a matter of weeks. In addition, the federal government is set to extend Australia's 10% goods and services tax to intangible supplies, such as digital content, games, and software, which would also impact the cost of using online streaming companies such as Netflix. Quickly, I just want to say, never have I ever had um, a company test a price change and then be like, oh, wait, no, never mind. We will not increase the price. I feel like... Yeah, it doesn't really go that way. It doesn't, well, like, it yeah. seems... We're just going to try this tax. We're going to... try it. Give it a try, see whether Ontario. or not, Ontario you know, doesn't last so long. No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, yeah. doesn't last or it stays and it's like, It oh. stays forever. We're just it never goes away. We're going to see what happens if your hydro bill goes up. Well, really, no. like, it's just, it's something you've ta taken for granted because, like, remember when Netflix Netflix came out, and it's just like the solid nine ninety nine or whatever. And now they've added the current like now you have the normal nine ninety nine, but nine ninety nine, and you could install it on all of your friends' computers. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did, like for our family. But now there's like the two tier system in Canada, yeah. anyways. How it's like the premium, like fourteen dollar or something. Which is what Sorry. I like. I have the best Netflix, and I love the best. Netflix. I love Netflix. Like I love it so much. It's ridiculous how much I love Netflix. So guess what, Netflix? I'll probably pay more. I don't want to. I'll be sad about it. But <laughs> you got me because you give me good shows. It's good content. Yeah, and they have and Netflix like originals is the problem. Mm -hmm. So you get hooked on yeah, Netflix originals, and then you can't even be like, I'll just cancel and go back to cable, or I'll just yeah, use right. you know, a Roku mm -hmm. or something. Like You can't do that with Roku Netflix. Roku has Netflix. Oh, right. But so. you can't just, like, oh, okay. Enough about <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like science fiction, but smartphones with batteries that fully charge in just five minutes could be available to consumers next year. The technology was first shown off in 2015 when Israeli startup StoreDot demonstrated its flash battery at the CES tech show in Las Vegas. Chief Executive Doran Meiserdorf recently said it is now expected to enter production in early 2018. Mr. Meiserdorf said that he could not reveal which manufacturers were signed up to use the technology. In 2015, he had said his firm's battery contained materials that allowed for non-traditional reactions and the unusually fast transfer of ions from an anode to a cathode, the electrical process that charges a battery. The design involves nanomaterials which feature extremely small structures and unnamed organic compounds. The company also unveiled an electric car battery that charges in five minutes at a tech show in Berlin this week. The firm said the battery provides 300 miles of range. Way to go. All right, MP3, the format that revolutionized the way we consume music since the 90s has been officially retired in a manner of speaking. The, gov the German research institution that created the MP3 format, the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits, announced that it had terminated licensing for certain MP3-related patents. In other words, they didn't want to keep up keep it on life support because there are better ways to store music here in 2017. 
In its place, the director of the Fraunhofer Institute said that the advanced audio coding, or what we know as the AAC format, has become the de facto standard for music download and videos on mobile phones. It's simply more efficient and has greater functionality as streaming TV and radio broadcasting use the format to deliver higher quality audio at lower bit rates than MP3. So sorry to see you go, MP3. Mm -hmm. Games company ZeniMax, which successfully sued Facebook-owned Oculus for $500 million earlier this year, has filed a new lawsuit over Samsung's Gear VR headset. The suit alleges that Samsung knowingly profited from Oculus technology that was first developed at ZeniMax, then misappropriated by Oculus executive John Carmack. Carmack, whose company ID Software was acquired by ZeniMax in 2009, was one of the driving forces behind the Gear VR. While the headset was released by Samsung, it's described as powered by Oculus with heavy software optimizations developed by Carmack. But the lawsuit alleges that Carmack owed much of his success at Oculus to software he developed as part of a team at ZeniMax. Among other things, the tech the Texas court filing claims that Carmack secretly brought Oculus and former ZeniMax employee Matt Hooper into ID Software's office, offices to develop an attack plan for mobile VR, which Oculus would later take to Samsung. The Samsung Gear VR was, al was also built on some of the same code as the Oculus Rift, which was the subject of ZeniMax's earlier lawsuit. The new lawsuit officially accuses Samsung of copyright infringement using ZeniMax VR code in the Gear VR, as well as trade secret misappropriation, unfair competition, and unjust enrichment. ZeniMax's case could be bolstered by the previous judgment against Oculus, since the Gear VR is unambiguous, unambiguously based on Oculus software. Oh, dangerous. All right. To say 2017 is a dangerous year to be online is an understatement. With reports of 200,000 computers infected in 150 countries this past weekend, mankind's newest cyber enemy, WannaCry, takes online threats to a new level. WannaCry not only encrypts a computer's files and makes them impossible to read, an unprotected PC with WannaCry also encrypts files on protected computers if those files are configured configured as a shared drive on the infected machine. We've seen this in earlier forms of ransomware. The malware also searches for other computers to infect over home and business networks, thereby propagating itself across the internet with devastating effect. In the past, health facilities, police and government offices have had to pay hackers to get their files back. With WannaCry, propagation doesn't depend on you opening a malware laced attachment in your email, although that helps, and it's easy for hackers to come back for seconds. Hackers can easily alter detected malware to make it hard to identify again and send it out afresh. They can also try to infiltrate backdoors into computers they infected the first time. Microsoft is under no obligation to continually update operating systems it retired a long, long ago. Namely, the big issue here comes from Windows XP. The public had been warned, warned that support for, for security updates would end, but continued to use old Windows XP systems despite warnings, not only from Microsoft, but security professionals and shows like ours. Keep in mind, too, that Microsoft makes millions of dollars by charging agencies such as the federal government to implement security updates for its old Windows XP systems. To make those expensive updates more widely available to the public and enterprise free of charge would undermine that cash flow. For an in-depth discussion of the WannaCry threat, join security researcher Mark Skilton along with ESET senior, senior security researcher Stephen Cobb on episode 504 of Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Thank you, Sasha. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and our website is Category5.tv. See how I faked her out there? Yes. It's like, oh, am what? I supposed what? to continue what? with What's the news? What's happening? What's happening? Why is he hovering over a button? 
Over it doesn't there. take much to, you know, no. freak me out <laughs> yeah. a little. I need like a little, he moved a his little hand. squirrel stuff oh or gosh. something. Oh, <laughs> squirrel, squirrel. Yeah. Uh, but that's all the time that we have tonight. It's been so much fun having you here. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot about this WannaCry threat tonight. So uh, make sure you join us again next week. I look forward to seeing you same time, same place here at Category5.tv. Take care. Bye.